Hey, welcome to Northside Online. We're so glad you're tuned in right now. We've got folks from all over the Warrensburg community and all over the country with us today. And we're excited to have the opportunity to gather like this in Jesus' name. We would love to know that you're with us, so don't forget to take a second to follow the Connect link and fill out a connection card. Yeah, it's a great way for us to learn more about you and for you to get to know us a little better as well. Maybe you've been thinking about returning to in-person services, or maybe you're new to the area and you're looking for a group of believers to grow with. Whatever your situation, we want you to know that you are welcome to pay us a visit. We have services every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, 9.20, and 10.40. The 8 a.m. service is our classic service where we sing hymns, while the 9.20 and 10.40 services both offer contemporary worship. We have an awesome experience waiting for your birth through elementary age kids in our Kids Corner during the 9.20 and 10.40 service times and your middle through high school students during the 9.20 service time. Our full-time children's and student ministry staff and our top-notch volunteers would love the opportunity to meet you and your family. Well, we really appreciate you being here with us this morning. It's time to get the service started, so I wanna thank you again for tuning in. Welcome to Northside Online. Side. How's it going? Great to have you here with us. Let's get to our feet. Let's sing to our God. If you're online with us, go ahead and stand up. Come on, let's sing. Sing, He's coming on the clouds. He is coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And our God is
join my hand and repeat the good confession. All you who are believers, you're welcome to repeat it with us. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. Well, I thank you for Allison and for her bright spirit, for her love for our country and her love for you and her love for the church. And I just am grateful today that she's uh, fully uh, following after you. Uh, she, you've convicted her that this is something she needs to do, and, and we're grateful for it. We thank you, Father, for all the promises of your word, and we just ask you to bless Allison, make her a great woman of God for you as she continues to follow after you. Help us as a church to love her and support her, and we look forward to sharing life together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Allison, having heard your confession, it's my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Northside, I am so glad to be here with you today. For those of you attending online, thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote, Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. I don't know what your circumstances are, but God does. And he's right there with you in those circumstances. So rejoice that he is there. Rejoice that he has a good plan and a purpose for your life. Pray that he would give you everything that you need to do, what he is calling you to do. And then give thanks to him for who he is and all that he's done and the fact that he is never, ever going to leave you. You are not here by accident. God is reaching out to you, so I encourage you to reach back out to him through the songs that we're singing this morning. Listen for him in the message that you hear today. Look for him everywhere you go and in everything that you do. Let's keep praising him right now. Grave 
thank you for all that you've done for me. Jesus, to fully praise you, it would take all eternity, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back.
majesty before my eyes I'll let it take my breath away Come on, let's just declare his holiness Let's lift our hands Sing. A million angels fall Face down on the floor All to echo holy is the
have a seat. Good morning. When was the last time you were silent and still before the Lord? When I think about being silent and still, I think about a men's retreat I was on in Alaska while being stationed up at Elmendorf. At this men's retreat, we were at the base of two mountains that were at the end of a 12 mile long lake called Eklutna Lake. Now this lake was fed by a stream that was coming from a glacier. And that morning the ministry leader uh, challenged us guys to go out and just spend some time with God in silence. And it had been snowing all morning, so I walked down to where the stream was in about four inches of snow, and I could hear these um, quarter-sized snowflakes that are just gently floating down and landing on the snow. There was not a single sound aside from the sound of these snowflakes falling. And what that kind of just talk to me about was that in today's world, we are just rushing around nonstop, whether it's a high-paced job, you know, tests at school, or if you have little kids, you don't even remember what a, a silent day felt like, right? But it's, this is, are the, these are the times in which God can speak to our hearts, right? In Psalms 37, 7, it says, be still and wait for the Lord. Like, we don't have to add anything to it. We just got to be there, be quiet, and listen. So while we prepare our hearts for a communion today, I challenge you guys to just take a moment and breathe. Close your eyes and just listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Remember what Christ has done for you on the cross as we enjoy communion. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this congregation here, Lord. I thank you for these people and what you have done for us through your Son, Lord. And I, I just ask you to help us to quiet our thoughts quiet, the, the many things that are just rushing through our heads, our thoughts right now, Lord, and, and help us to, to think about you. And I ask you to, to prepare our hearts and our mind for the, the sermon that Sid's about to bring. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this in your name. Amen.
Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. Uh, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to download the church app. The directions are on the screens behind me, and there are QR codes on a few of the chairs out in the congregation, so you could scan that to download the app. Uh, the app has all kinds of resources for you, events, ways to connect with ministry staff and community groups. It has resources you can use on Sunday morning while you're here at worship. Um, and one thing I want to highlight for you is the giving. You can give through the app, you can give through the website, or you can give by cash or check at the back of the worship center if that's what you prefer. Um, we also, have, as I said, have many events, and I want to tell you about a couple of them that are coming up. The Women's Retreat is in two weeks on March 25th and 26th. And this will be a time of food, fellowship, and teaching from some wonderful ladies here at Northside. And I would encourage all the ladies here today to come to the retreat, sign up, and bring a friend. We also have baby dedication happening on March 27th. Uh, this is an opportunity for parents to make a commitment to raise their children to know and love Jesus. And if you are interested in participating in the baby dedication, there is a class on March 20th. The night of worship is also on March 27th. It'll be at 6 p.m. This is a family-friendly event, meaning all ages are welcome to come join us in the worship center as we spend an hour praising and worshiping our wonderful God. All of these events and much, much more can be found on the church app, or you can stop by the Connection Center after service. Right now, if you have picked up a bulletin or you're following along with the sermon notes in the app, please go ahead and take that out as Sid brings our message, Fighting for Freedom. I feel confident you, like me, your heart breaks every time you turn on the news and see the, the horrific scenes from Ukraine, how awful that is. But I've been thinking about this week, what if I lived in Ukraine? What if there were bombs raining down on my town every night? What if uh, there was a foreign power trying to take away my freedom even wanting to take away my statehood and then I take it to this I think about what if there were a foreign power that invaded Missouri and and came here to Warrensburg what would I do would I would I fight would I work to defend my town and our way of life it's a good question you know, I planned this series. The Holy Spirit led me to plan it last year. And like so often happens, we see this current event, and I would encourage you to pray for those folks in Ukraine. There, it's the battle between an author authoritarian dictator type of government and democracy, freedom. I think it's the same battle that Paul is addressing in Galatians figuratively that there are people who when they come to Christ they have a hard time accepting grace they have a hard time accepting that from the Old Testament to the New the way God interacted with his people it changed and Jesus said I came not to abolish the law but to fulfill it he says that he came to set the prisoners free it says and makes clear to us in the New Testament that the freedom we are to have in Christ, the only one who can take that away is us falling back into a reliance on performance to please God, a reliance on doing this and that, our works, to be saved by God, to to live working and walking with God. And so my contention is, and I think what Paul's saying here, in this is like a, a closing argument to the Galatians because uh, he knows that Judaizers have stirred them up or, and wanting them to go back uh, to not only being saved in Christ, but by being saved by keeping the law as well, that Christ wasn't enough for their salvation and for them to live as Christians. He's saying you've got to fight for freedom every day. That's the point I'm making for us today. 
That's what Paul is saying to us today. I break this down into three daily critical choices all of us must make. And very important is the word daily I include there. Because this is a battle we'll have to face every day. Why? Because there are people around us who will want to enforce their version, their vision of Christianity on us. There are umpteen denominations and folks who want to add to their expectations of what you have to do to be a Christian, of what you have to do to be a good Christian. And sometimes directly they say, often indirectly they convey that if you don't live up to all these standards, the, these man-made rules that you somehow are not a brother or sister to them. It's a test of fellowship. So we make these choices and we must make them every day. The first choice we make is, are we going to live in slavery or freedom? Paul says in uh, Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by yoke of slavery. They had heard this message of freedom from Paul when he established a church. The church is in Galatia. Now there are folks who have come in from Jerusalem who say it, not only is it enough to be baptized into Christ, you also, if you're a male, you must be circumcised. In other words, saying you have to live not just by grace, but also by the law. Underlying this statement here, what is the, the background of it? It's the reality, Paul's saying, that grace and works don't mix. And I mean works as a means of earning your salvation, as a means of earning or gaining God's favor. Either you're saved wholly and only by God's grace, or you feel you must do something else to merit God's favor, or many somethings else. Those two options, listen, they're mutually exclusive. The problem is that we live in a performance-based world. The problem is that we often, we feel out of sorts if we don't have structure. We, have out, we feel out of sorts if, if we don't have rules and standards for our lives. And our great tendency is in the church amongst Christianity is to define in those gray areas, those areas that aren't clearly addressed in Scripture, our own morality, the do's and don'ts, and try to live by them ourselves and then also extend them to others and judge others who don't live by the same standards. So performance-based world and us feeling the need, us being insecure to live in a place where each person is individually led by the spirit individually follows christ we want we want to set a, a structure a standard for what good christians do and what happens then we're choosing to be enslaved by those extra biblical standards or choices again and we foist them on others. There are preachers who lay a go yoke of guilt on their people by adding demands to the Christian life that do not come, that do not come from the Bible. Preachers that say, you must wear a suit or you must wear a dress to come to church. Pre pre preachers who say that hymns are not of God or contemporary Christian songs are from the devil. Preachers who say that you should never dance. Preachers who say that you shouldn't have tattoos. And I could go on and on and on. Preachers who say you have to repeat the doxology in every service or you pray by the Lord's prayer or you have to do it through this hymn or this book of order. It goes on and on. In this performance-based society, what happens is we have conditions for having fellowship. And we do that to each other in marriage. Our culture teaches us that as long as you're getting your needs met in marriage, you stay married. Married, But if that person doesn't perform according to your standards, you fall out of love and you separate. Jobs are like that. 
if you don't live up to the standards on the job description then you probably aren't going to be working here anymore sports are like that football coaches are like that there was a field goal kicker who was about to try the, the only a few seconds left a game winning field goal and he went up to the coach and he said a coach if I miss this field goal will you still love me the coach said sure I'll love you son but I'm gonna miss you too <laughs> we live in a performance based society and we take that upon ourselves we extend that to others how do we stand firm in our freedom when we live in a performance-based world the answer is this you must continually remind yourselves that God saved you by his grace it is for freedom that Christ has set us free God means for none of us to dread being a Christian none of us to impose upon ourselves this network of expectations that aren't biblically grounded and aren't biblically founded listen I am not saying make sure you understand this I am not saying that we shouldn't have standards for Christian conduct I'm not saying that God doesn't give us guidance on what Christians should and shouldn't do and establish some rules. Jesus said he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And do you know the embodiment of the law is the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying that you shouldn't follow the Ten Commandments because they are clearly in black and white in Scripture. And even more, this is what I want you to know, that every one of those Ten Commandments except one, Jesus repeated. And he not only repeated them, he made them more demanding. The only commandment he didn't repeat was remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, I think that principle is still a godly principle. We all need rest. But the Sabbath day in the Jewish calendar was Saturday. It's why they worship on Saturday still. But Christians worship on the Lord's Day, Sunday. But what I mean by demanding, even more demanding, for example, uh, Jesus said that no one should commit adultery but in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, but I tell you, even if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. It's not just doing, it's thinking about it that becomes sin, that becomes a guide, a guide for our behavior. But the motivation for keeping those black and whites is this, it is for the love of God it is because we love God and we want to please God it is not because we fear if we don't somehow always keep up those expectations if we all if we happen to lust in our mind that our salvation might be taken away from us that that is the the yoke of slavery God doesn't want us to have again so he gives us those guidelines and we we aspire to them out of love not fear for losing our salvation and neither do we then take the, those areas that aren't clear and make those expectations as well so we choose every day whether we're going to be slaves or free we choose every day whether we're going to primarily live by law or by grace verse 2 mark my words I Paul tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised Christ will be of no value to you at all. This verse needs to be compared. I'll read to you verse 6 in a moment where it says, Paul says circumcision doesn't matter one way or the other. It's not a meritorious act and it's not a sin in and of itself. I want you to hear me clearly. He's saying it's okay if you as a Christian choose to be circumcised out of respect for God or worship God. That's fine. Just don't expect everybody to do it. And that's the life application I'm saying for us in this church. You, I encourage you to have opinions and preferences about how you're going to live your life. If you love hymns, go for it. If you love choruses or contemporary Christian song, more power to you. If you want to get tattooed, fine do it as long as there's nothing offensive to God in the tattoo I'm not going to get tattooed because I don't like getting hurt 
but it's your choice to or not to I'm not going to force it on you and how many preachers have you heard take their own personal opinions not grounded in scripture and force it on their people that's not going to happen here we are people of the book we're going to live by the book and what the book says is that the only way my sorry pathetic self can be saved is by throwing myself at the foot of the cross and trusting in Jesus to be saved it is not anything I do that makes me worthy of salvation it, as I am saved then I'm going to want to please God and I'm going to do a lot of worthy things but I, the, the saving by grace comes first and I need to live with grace with others and let them follow in the way they follow Jesus not me or not my opinions he says here listen mark my words I will tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised Christ will be of no value to of you of all if you start falling back into the works performance based appraisal of yourself and others you're in trouble again I declare every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law check that out if you start extending all your preferences on others if you start saying you got to live every part of the Old Testament law there's no picking and choosing it's, the law is not a cafeteria where you can say I'd like a helping of circumcision but I don't want any sacrifices I'm going to hold off on the feast days but I'll take an extra helping of the Levitical priesthood it doesn't work that way the law of God is an all or nothing proposition James 2.10 says if you offend in one point of the law you're guilty of breaking the whole law who of us would ever want God's standard of judgment to be do we keep the law all the time and always <laughs> none of us so why do we want to go back to it we're insecure we need structure we live in a performance-based society but the truth of God's word says that you have your standing in God through Christ and once you become a son or daughter you're not going to get cast out unless you choose to leave you will have standards to live by but the standards that you must agree on are clear black and white in scripture where there is gray we have grace where there is opinion and preference we extend that grace to others and that's the third point he says here you you've fallen away from grace if you go back to the law for through the spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love I'm going to come back to that because that is that's the heart of it verse 6 is the verse you want to memorize this week from this passage of scripture the third decision every day we must make is circumcision of the cross I, you know I really I, I, I struggle with this point and I'm, I'm changing it so y'all scratch out circumcision and put conformity conformity or the cross it's important five dangers of living by the law of conforming to what other people say instead of grace you asking God what he says you following and living your life to please God rather than people around you verse that stops our spiritual progress he says in verse 7 you're running a good grace who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth these new Christians in Galatians started off strong but then these Judaizers came in and confused them I'll talk about that in a moment they they got them off track they helped these people who had been set free start being burdened by expectations again so I ask you this in your witness your example to others are you helping them get on track are you maybe leading them astray in your life is there anybody or anything that's caused you to lose focus on Jesus as your model as your example as your goal 
Is there anything or anybody that's caused you to get off track? Who's cut in on you? Boy, it drives me crazy when people cut in on me in the road or in the shopping place. But we just let people cut in on us spiritually. We need to stop that. It stops our spiritual progress. It pulls us away from God. Secondly, verse 8, this kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. He, he does not lead us astray. The, to go back to a legalism, it actually pulls you away from God. It doesn't help you go closer to God. Why? Because your focus is the rules. It's not God. Your focus is the legalist. It's not God. Third, it, it also, um, well, actually, I want to read this verse too because it's important. Second Corinthians 3, 3, 3, 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It is a fundamental principle of ministry. You've heard me say it if you've been here a while. I trust God to lead you through his Spirit. So I don't need to tell you everything you need to watch or not watch. I don't need to tell you everything you should do or not do. I trust if you are open to and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, if you are seeking to be a disciple of Jesus, then you are going to let the Spirit lead you in those choices. I don't have to tell you everything. And listen, you don't have to tell people everything. It is a hard thing for us Christian parents to understand as our kids get older we have to pull back on the reins we have to pull back on telling them every choice they need to make we have to trust if they have given their life to Christ we have to trust the Holy Spirit to lead them and give them the freedom to do it hard to do we are uh, a few of us are opinionated third it leads to more errors Look what he says in verse 9. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And that's true. Once you got a little yeast, yeast in some dough, can you pull it back out? You got to start over. Has anybody ever told just one lie? No. You got to then tell another lie to cover up that lie. Likewise, if you start having um, thus you must do's in areas of preference and opinion, it's hard to stop. It's hard to stop because a little yeast, that expectation, that attitude becomes normative for the body. If I start making my opinions, expectations for you and your Christian walk, it's hard for me to stop. Because then you're asking me to define what is pleasing to God and not the Holy Spirit. Fourth, it produces spiritual confusion. What really is just terrible and so damaging is that it the effect it has on new Christians I am firmly convinced that many people don't reject Jesus they claim they reject people who claim to be representing him they don't become Christians they don't stay long enough to hear the life-saving gospel and so they run from the rules they run from the legalism not Jesus they rightfully don't want to move from slavery to sin to slavery to rules and so he says here in verse 10 i'm confident in the lord that you'll take no other view the one who's throwing you into confusion whoever that may be will have to pay the penalty these judaizers had confused the young christians in galatia and lastly and importantly it removes the meaning and stigma of the cross if you live in a rules-based Christianity an opinion based Christianity if if we are saved by what we do our works then there's no need for the cross we make it meaningless verse 11 brothers and sisters if I'm still preaching circumcision Paul's saying it's a funny way he writes it but he's saying if if I just wanted to have peace I would preach circumcision but I don't. In that case, the events of the cross has been abolished. I would never think about preaching a person has to be circumcised to be saved. 
because it takes away you can't just have one part of the law it takes away the need uh, it takes away the vitality of the cross in the salvation process as for those agitators I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves I as I read that go back to verse 5 which says for through the spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope how righteousness remember means right before God how do you become right before God it's through your faith by his grace for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value it is Christ who has to be the focus that's what he's saying and if you become a Christian by believing in Jesus Christ you become a person in Christ and here verse 6 I told you this is the verse to memorize the only thing that counts that's a strong statement what matters most is your faith expressing itself through love your motivation is through love not fear and it is faith in Jesus Christ it's not your faith in keeping the rules are other people's faith in keeping your rules and expectations it is by faith expressing itself through love so real quick three vital conclusions first when it comes to the gospel gospel means good news there can be no compromise we confuse young Christians if we try to live in both worlds I say to you, any belief in why I always preach expository biblical sermons where I attempt to interpret what they mean faithfully, I will tell you that it, there is not going to be compromise based on what the culture says or doesn't say. If we teach something, it will have a foundation, a book, chapter, and verse underlying it, or several, ideally, book, chapters, and verses underlying it. It will come from the book when it comes to the gospel to what we believe there cannot be a compromise where the scripture is clear black and white you should do this you shouldn't do this uh, who God is who Jesus is that the Bible's inspired fallible word of God uh, those things we agree on there's no compromise but even a small compromise produces disastrous consequences if we conflate the two if we start making our opinions or preferences binding on others if we start making our opinions and preferences that aren't founded in scripture that aren't founded in the, the thing that God would want us to do then we drive people away it produces disastrous consequences I call those tests of fellowship and unfortunately I've experienced that in other places test of fellowship where uh, a person would say if you have music in, music in, musical instruments in your service then you're not a brother or sister in Christ if you have a tattoo or a piercing I'm not a brother or sister to you test of fellowship those small compromises whenever we start drifting back into works-based approval or Christianity God making a person a Christian or not by works it can be disastrous and the, the heartbreaking thing to me is that it drives people away I, I really think that a lot of folks they don't reject Christ they reject people who claim to stand for him we don't want to be that we're not going to be that here and lastly the only thing that matters is faith in Jesus expressing itself through love that is the standard that is the filter I'm going to tell you hear me clearly that is my standard as I go through my life and I make choices I ask myself what would Jesus want me to say here what would he want me to do here and so in these areas of gray I make choices that maybe you wouldn't make but I ask you to give me the courtesy to let me be led by the spirit in my way and you be I'll give you the courtesy to let you be led by the spirit in your way
that make sense and so that's the standard we're going to have here and I'm going to tell you it threatens a lot of people being people of the book threatens those who on the left who are more interested in being politically correct and reflecting the culture it threatens people on the right who are uncomfortable with grace who are uncomfortable letting each person be led by the spirit to make their own preferential choices it threatens them one of you shared my message last week with some family because you were concerned about them being in a law-based a legalistic christian church you hoped it would be influential it would help them to maybe find some freedom but they reacted the other way and they told you that your preacher had gone over to satan he had lost his focus on jesus and he was of the devil <laughs> oh lord is right but i'm gonna say to you i did not take that personal and here's why i didn't take it personal because any criticism i get it always goes through this filter. Now, I didn't always know this, but I've learned this. I, it goes through this filter. Did I please God? Did I please Jesus with the message I preached last week? And it's right here in the book. Amen. Ephesians 4, 21 to 31 is what I talked about last week. It's right there. This is right there. It's hard to argue with. It is for freedom that Christ let us set us free and to be going back to the law is to be burned again by the yoke of slavery let me say to you i love following jesus i love being a christian i love being a christian and i don't let others rob and suck out my joy Amen. by their legalism Amen. and neither should you you ask yourself i'm not saying i don't listen to criticism but I, what i do is evaluate the merit of it did what I preached last week or this week, hopefully, did it, did it please God? Was it true to his word? If it is, then I don't even worry one bit about the criticism. I know who I follow, and it's certainly not the devil. It's Jesus. And in fact, what I'm saying is the opposite. What I'm saying is the freedom we find is not in the rules. It is in Jesus. And that is the standard all of us should strive for. Hebrews says, let us focus our eyes on Jesus. Let us throw off all that so easily entangles. Let us focus our eyes and run the race we were meant to race. Right, right, race, that's what I'm trying to say. And let us follow him and him alone. Don't conform run to the cross we find our meaning we find our purpose we find our life as we lose it we find our life as we surrender to the cross as we find ourselves looking and following jesus as we find ourselves being saved by grace we listen the church of god we have to we have to be saved by grace we have to live with grace thank you lord for your love and your goodness and we're human it's easy to get caught up in this performance-based world it's easy to let others opinions and our desire to conform to make us feel trapped and enslaved again but you want us to be free you want us to be free ourselves you want us to give freedom to others where the bible is clear let us always speak but where it is silent let us give each other grace <laughs> let us live as we were meant to as free followers disciples of your son jesus so give us wisdom give us wisdom through your word give us wisdom through your spirit on how to live 
as free believers and we thank you for this body we thank you for your word we thank you most of all for Jesus and who we pray amen, amen. so you saw Allison be baptized earlier this is her husband Justin y'all stand and this is their oldest child Kinsley I went and visited with them uh, and what a good time Kinsley is three she has Cooper and yes and Carson her siblings yeah she's not shy she'll tell you about it yeah her hair is short yeah her hair is short. Yeah. all right all right kids I'll give you the microphone in a minute okay after I say the amen but I'm gonna uh, tell you one I appreciate y'all serving our country uh, Justin's a pilot and as, as y'all know the yep yeah, the family serves as well as the individual in in the service and so thank you for your service and we're so grateful y'all have come and you're already serving here but you formally join us today we're grateful for that and thanks for letting us share in your baptism I'm gonna have you join my hand and repeat after me yeah Kinsley you can put your hand there too y'all pre repeat after me if you're a believer you repeat the good confession because that's the heart of our faith I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the, Christ the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God my, Lord and my Lord and Savior Father thank you for this family for their love for each other for their love for you uh, I'm just grateful to, to be a church family that can uh, have them love us and support us and we love and support them help us to encourage them and challenge them and help us all to walk together in freedom to, to please you to, to witness for you uh, to serve you I pray, Father, that you'd, you'd bless their marriage. I pray you bless their family and help us to, uh, to help them. And uh, we are just grateful for this chance to share life together. I ask for you uh, to bring us close together and help us to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Y'all can have a seat. Y'all come greet them after the service. You come greet them. That's your only excuse uh, to not stack chairs with us. <laughs> Uh, we are going to need to stack chairs today. That is um, six, each chair, the, there's six to a stack. The pocket chairs, the end chairs go in their own stacks. And you push them to the outside of the building, the, the chairs facing the wall. Uh, there's some veterans here. If, you just, if you're willing, don't know what to do, just follow them. Uh, they'll show you what to do. And the more people do it, the quicker it, it uh, gets done. So if you can help us with that, it'd be great. It's been an outstanding day with Allison's baptism. The lenders joining us. I want to tell you in the, the second service, uh, we had Daryl and Renee Burgess and their daughter Abby and uh, Ryan and Crystal McGuire and their daughters, Kristen and Emma. They all joined us by transfer. So uh, that's uh, eight or nine folks today. Uh, we're, we're just grateful that God's moving here. Remember our mission. It's to lead people to Jesus and equip them to follow him. And so everything we do is for that purpose. It's why we focus on him and not our own laws and rules. And so we're excited about what God's doing here and glad you're part of that. Let us know how we can help you in your spiritual journey. Maybe it is baptism. Maybe it's joining us. Uh, maybe it's some other questions or, or whatnot you have about growing. We're here to help you in that. After the service, Bob and Brenda Toman are going to be up here. Bob's one of our elders. Uh, you can come visit with them. Uh, I'll be back at the door or you can set up a time to visit with me uh, like the lenders had me come over to their house we had a great visit your kids were so well behaved all three and under yes Kenley that was you she, she looks at me look. I'm talking about you girl all right so uh, if I, you want me to come to your house or you want to come here and visit whatever I'd be glad to help you and we're here for you okay let's stand I'm going to pray for us if you can help us stack chairs I'd appreciate it Thank you, Lord, for your blessing, for your love for us, uh, and your trust in us. You, uh, you save us by grace, and you, you expect us to live by grace. So help us to do that this week. Help us to represent you well. Help us to give others around us the freedom that you give us. Help us to be gracious. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.